Hi, everybody. Welcome to Communication with Color. So today we're going to talk about how do animals communicate with each other using color, because most animals don't have a language they can really use to talk to each other about what they like and what they don't like and what they're trying to tell another animal. So today we're going to talk about how animals use color to communicate. Okay. So, here we go, communication with color. So, first off, who am I? I am Beth Davis-Berg. I am a professor of biology at Columbia College, Chicago. I have a family you can see here who is rather silly. My daughter is nine and my little guy is five, so it's a slightly old picture. Um, I do fun things like teach ecology with Pokemon Go. So we use and catch Pokemon and use that to learn neat things about ecology. I do field work even when pregnant, which you can see in that picture. Um, I study snails. And I even take students with me into the field. But today we're going to talk about color and communication. So my first question for you is, how do you communicate? Do you talk to people? Do you make silly noises? Sometimes my kids make silly noises rather than actually using their words. What do you do? Can you use color to communicate? Has anybody ever played the game red light, green light? So red light, green light is this game where someone will say green light and everybody tries to walk towards them. And then when they say red light, everyone stops. It's just like a traffic signal. So can you communicate with the colors you wear in your clothes? What if you wear all white or wear all red or wear all green or black? What might that be telling people? What about hair color? Is that a way to communicate to others? So even though we tend to use language to communicate, we also use colors to communicate. And we also use the types of things we wear to communicate. So if you're going out to a fancy restaurant or to a wedding or something like that, you might wear something fancy. And you're communicating to others that you're dressed appropriately for the occasion. If you're going to play in the yard and get muddy, you're probably going to wear a different kind of clothes. And your outdoor play clothes might communicate to other people that you're ready to go outside and play. And so I think we all do use color to communicate. We just don't always think about it. We think about wearing our favorite shirt or something we like to wear. Okay. So one of the most important things to know about animals in general is generally bright colors mean poisonous. So if something in nature is a really bright color and it's not a flower, you might want to be careful. So these guys are poisonous frogs. They're really bright colors, as you can see. I love how bright blue that frog is. And I really like the bright orange. And so bright colors tend to be telling everything else that there's something different about them. And in these case, they've got poison. So we might not want to touch them. Now, does everybody know what these guys are? You might see them in your yard. You might see them in your house. Sometimes they sneak into houses. They're ladybugs or ladybird be beetles if you're from the UK. So they're actually a beetle, not a bug. Those are different things. My family tells me I'm weird because I will tell people that bugs and beetles are different because bugs is a specific kind of insect. But these are beetles. And ladybugs, as we like to call them, 
sometimes are kind of smelly. You might have noticed this. If you pick up a ladybug, sometimes your hands will smell afterwards. And especially if with the Asian ladybugs, which are invasive here, if you smush those, they're really smelly. They, all of your ladybugs, no matter what kind, have a stinky fluid that they will spray at predators to make them go away. That's why they smell just a little bit and not much and you got to get up close, but they're stinky. So they're using their bright color to communicate to predators, you don't want to eat me, you don't want to eat me. The next animal we're going to look at is an animal that's a spider. Who likes spiders? I do. No one else? A few of you do, maybe. Well, anyway, we're going to look at Black Widows. And I don't mean the Marvel character, although she's based off this spider. So Black Widows look like this. They're known for having a big, mostly roundish abdomen that, as you can see from this picture, has a little pointy bit at the end. And most Black Widows have this red hourglass on their abdomen. And that red and black coloration is telling predators that these guys are poisonous. Black widows have their name because many, but not all, many black widows eat their mates. And so they're called black widows because they make their, they make themselves a widow by eating them. But they're just big predatory spiders. And all spiders are predators and spiders eat insects, even black widows. They're not bad to have around. You just probably don't want them in your house because you don't really want to get bitten by a poisonous spider. Most spiders though aren't poisonous or at least not to us. Now, there is a spider that is poisonous to us, but it doesn't live here. It lives in Australia also known as the land of where you find a lot of poisonous creatures. So these guys are a relative of the black widows. They're called redback spiders. So I'm gonna show you a picture. These are not spiders you wanna pick up ever. So they have a big red stripe on the back, hence redbacks. And you can see the males are really small in comparison to the females. And again, redback spiders sometimes eat their mates. That's what she does. But you can also see they eat lizards. They have a very powerful venom and they're really relatively large spiders. Um, and they can eat small lizards. Now spiders, do all sorts of other interesting color communication, not just by having color markings. They also, like the peacock spiders and jumping spiders, they do dances. So as you can see here, they're lifting up some of their legs and their pedipalps, and they do these little dances. And they dance like this, and they stomp their feet, and they try their best to dis they do these fancy displays and it's the male spiders. The male spiders do these fancy dances to try to impress the female spiders. So they are communicating and they're showing off their abdomen. So that's their abdomen, their, their butt that they're sticking up in the air and they're shaking it around and they shake, shake, shake and they stomp, stomp, stomp. And they make all these noises and dances to try to convince the female who's just going to watch and go, hmm, maybe, maybe not. We'll see how well he dances. And there's lots of neat videos online of these guys dancing. So you can look them up. I put some links at the end and your parents can help you. So spiders use lots of different kinds of col colors. So some of them use colors to just passively 
tell other animals that, hey, I'm poisonous, you don't want to eat me. And others are using color to talk to, for the boy spiders, to talk to the girl spiders and tell them, hey, I think I'm a nice guy. You want to you wanna come talk? And they stomp and dance and it's fun to watch. Now, what do we have here? Anybody recognize it? It's a skunk. Now, everybody knows what a skunk is. They're black and they're white and they spray stinky, stinky smell. So their colors, that distinctive black and white coloration is telling everybody else, stay back. And if you've ever seen a skunk get mad, they take their tail and they put it up in the air and it gets all puffy and they try to warn you. They really do. They shake their tail. They get big and fluffy up. If you've ever, like dogs and cats do this too, when they get upset, they get their hackles up and they get all like, Rah. Um, and skunks do this too. They get really excited and they shake that black and white tail, making it really obvious that they're upset. And they're going to do that before they spray. And as anybody who's ever had a dog sprayed by a skunk or been by an area that has been sprayed by a skunk, you know it's really smelly. And so in this case, skunks are using their coloration to try to warn people, people or dogs or other animals off that, hey, I'm going to spray you. No, really, I'm going to spray you. Go away. And when the animal doesn't go away, they spray you. So a lot of us have played with little monarch butterflies because they're very sweet. So this is the monarch caterpillar. They're bright colors. So bright yellow and white stripes. You've got the monarch butterfly adult. And monarchs feed on this plant up here. And that's milkweed. And monarchs, because of the milkweed they feed on, so it's a plant that gives them toxins inside their system, they're gonna make whatever eats them sick. And so they are brightly colored either as a caterpillar or as an adult to really warn predators away. So a lot of the coloration is trying to tell whoever wants to eat them, hey, don't eat me, I'm not gonna taste good. And it might work. Now, there's other ways to communicate that are a little less about just showing colors, but about sort of showing patterns. So a lot of moths do this. And I'm going to show you a picture. And a lot of moths have these eye spots on their second set of wings. So when their wings are closed, because you don't normally see moths showing off their back wings, they look like a normal moth. But when they're threatened, they open up those wings and you see these big eye spots. Now, the other thing to know is a lot of animals don't see as well as we do. They may see color, but they can see those eye spots. And as you can tell, those eye spots look a lot like an owl or a big bird. And most things that eat moths get eaten by big birds. And so if you see eye spots on the side of the tree, you're like, uh oh, it's an owl. I'm going to go away now. And so a lot of these moths, a lot of different kinds of moths, I picked one that was easy to see, but a lot of different kinds of moths have eye spots. And it's so they can flash them to potential predators and hopefully not get eaten. And so this is a kind of communication that is a little different than just being one color or a behavior. It's, it's again, it's a behavior showing a communication. But some moths also do other interesting things. So this moth has these little fake antennae on the back of their wings. So it kind of looks like their face is over by their butt. And that means that their coloration is possibly tricking some, an animal to think that they're facing one way 
and not another. And if they lose the back bit of their wing, it's not their head, they might be okay. So it's another way to communicate. So the last two things we're going to talk about are some of my two favorite. We're going to talk about chameleons and cuttlefish. So first off, chameleons. So chameleons, as we talked about last time too, they can use color changes and they do all sorts of color changes. So I've put a whole bunch of pictures here so we could talk about them. So we've got this guy up here and you can see the stripes. And this guy's got stripes here. These are all veiled chameleons. And this picture shows how they darken to show submission. So when two male chameleons meet each other, they will often do this sort of posturing to try to figure out who's the bigger chameleon or who's the stronger chameleon or who's going to win that contest. And they will actually fight sometimes. And what usually happens is they start changing their color and showing all these stripes and colors. And then they stand there and they look all big and chameleon-like. And usually the one that has the brighter stripes and will be the one that might actually win the fight, it will walk forward towards the other chameleon. Now, if the other chameleon is much smaller and doesn't, doesn't really want to be a threat, what they're going to do, as you can see from this, is they're going to go from having these stripes to changing their colors to sort of this dark and dull brown. So they're going to say, hey, hey, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'll back off. I'll back off. And they'll do that with the color. And so by changing to that different color, they're communicating to the other male that, hey, no, I'm, it's, it's okay. It's okay. I'm, I'm, I'll go stand back here. And so they're showing that they're submissive to the other chameleon. And as we saw last time, chameleons can also just change color to match their surroundings. But there's a lot of a lot of research actually happening on how chameleons change color and what are they actually telling another chameleon. And that part's really neat. And I think this is this is work, by the way, with Russell Lingen and Kevin McGraw, who are at Arizona State University. And there's a lot of research trying to figure out what what does the other chameleon see? So it's one thing for us to notice that that chameleon went from green to brown. That's kind of cool. And we might be able to say, well, it looks like that one, that chameleon's kind of backing off or becoming a little more submissive. But it doesn't mean that we know what the other chameleon understands. And so there's a lot of research to try to figure out not only what do we see and what do we think is going on, but what does the other chameleon see and what, did, what does it look like, how their behavior is changing and going on. So that's kind of neat. I put more information at the end if you want to learn more about chameleons. There's a whole lot of neat videos online of chameleons changing colors and things like that. So the last communication I wanted to talk about are cuttlefish. Now, cuttlefish are mollusks, which is what I study. So it happens to be one of my favorite animals. Now, first off, I'm going to, before I, what we watch a video, I'm going to show you, I'm going to have you guys look at the cuttlefish. So we've got a nice big eye here. So cuttlefish and octopuses are really good at seeing. They have very good eyes. And because they have really good eyes and they can see color and they can, they're, they're very good at seeing, they can do a lot with communication. And so cuttlefish, like that octopus video we watched last time, can change color and can change texture and they can become like iridescent and make stripes and all sorts of stuff like that. So they can just change it all. And when they're swimming, they can pulse colors to talk to other cuttlefish. And a lot of times, and you'll notice a lot of the coloration that we've studied is about mating and when males and female cuttlefish are getting together. Um, and a lot of times the male cuttlefish, if they are 
interested in a female cuttlefish will flash colors at each other to say, hey, I'm here. I'm here too. And they'll kind of talk to each other like that. Um, and so the video we're going to watch is from the publication, The New Scientist. And it's going to talk about some of the color changes that they've discovered in aggressive behavior between cuttlefish and other things like that. But I think one of the really neat things is some cuttlefish are pretty small. Some are much larger. But it's clear that these color patterns, which everybody who's been diving in the ocean or gone snorkeling has seen for a really long time, is actually being used to communicate. And that part's really neat. Okay, so let me I'm gonna stop the share and move us over to the video. Hold on a second. Zoom always makes this extra fun to do. Okay. So this video is called, Do You Speak Cuttlefish? Um, the other thing I'm going to say is the New Scientist is a, a journal from United Kingdom. And so there's going to be a few words that get pronounced differently than the way those of us that are American pronounce things. So she's going to say zebra instead of zebra stripes on the cuttlefish. Um, and there might be a few other words that get pronounced a little different. Okay, first, turn on closed captionings. And they're auto-generated, so hopefully they'll be okay. They'll be close. So we're going to go here to Do You Speak Cuttlefish? And is it showing? I'm just going to make sure this is showing the right one. Okay. So let's see. Meet the cuttlefish, a mollusk well known for its exceptional camouflage skills. In about two seconds, it can dissolve into the background and then stand out again. It does this by opening and closing red, yellow and brown pigmented sacs called chromatophores in its skin. These are under direct control of the nervous system, which is why they can change so fast. It also has specialised reflector cells in the skin, which give iridescent greens and blues. But not only can it modify its colour, it can also change its texture. Bundles of muscles can make its skin go from smooth to spiky, so that it blends in with surrounding rocks. Recently, researchers have been finding out that cuttlefish are also masters of communication. They don't only change their body patterns to fit in, but also use different motifs to communicate with fellow cuttlefish. This male and female pair are enjoying a romantic moment. Some other males approach and try and get in on the action, but the male wants to tell them that the female is all his. By making his zebra stripes more distinct, he's clearly signalling his masculinity. He also stretches out one of his arms as a barrier. He won't let the other males get any closer. Cuttlefish don't only have to deal with each other, there are also predators and prey to attend to. In this case, the pair senses a threat from the diver who's videotaping them and decides to take action. The female camouflages herself to hide while the male gives a V signal. Not really a peace sign, but rather an attempt to startle the diver so he can get away. But most remarkable is the recent discovery that cuttlefish can tailor their responses to different threats. This display is called the passing cloud and can be used to distract prey. It translates as something like, watch this so I can catch you. The moving pattern is hard to focus on and can also be used to confuse predators. Mesmerised by the psychedelic display, they won't be able to tell if a cuttlefish is there or not. Fish like sea bass, or in this case a balan wrasse, can be threatening, and cuttlefish have a specific message for them. They flatten their body so it takes up as much space as possible and fan out their fins. Two scary black eye spots appear on their back. What they're trying to say is, back off, I'm much bigger than you. But they won't try this with all predators, as some wouldn't be that easily fooled. Crabs, for example, hunt by using smell. Dogfish locate foods by sensing electric fields. When confronted by these animals, a cuttlefish uses the most sensible approach. It will swim for its life. So 
so I hope everyone really liked that video of cuttlefish. Um, I really love how they can use zebra stripes to have the males communicate with other males and they do that little V where they sort of stand there and show their stripes to encourage potential predators to swim away. And I'm really a fan of where they get big and flat and get those dark little eye spots on the back to really scare other predators away. And I, I just, I think cuttlefish communication is really interesting. And I think it's especially interesting to think about how other animals communicate with each other and how do they use color. And if they're going to use color to communicate, animals need to be able to see the color and they need to be able to interpret what they're seeing. And so think about how do humans communicate? How do humans use color to communicate? How to cuttlefish? And think about all these different things. And I hope that you've found this a really interesting way to learn about color and communication. Um, and just because I promised I would show everybody those last few um, resources here at the end. Um, so again, here's the cuttlefish. And these are the resources for other information. There's lots of information on how jumping spiders communicate and how chameleons communicate with each other and butterflies and moths with eye spots and all sorts of things like that. So I want everybody to go into their backyard to look around, look at how different animals are communicating, look at, watch them, just really watch the world around you and see what you can see. And thank you all for listening to my presentation and learning about color and communication and all the really neat things that are happening in the world around us and also how much we don't know yet. And so if this is really fascinating to you, there is many, many opportunities as you grow up to continue learning about animals and communication and color. So have a great day and I hope to see everyone this soon. Thank you.